Good evening, Flint Hill Baptist Church and beyond, and welcome to Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. I hope you'll grab your Bible, grab a cup of, cup of coffee, cup of hot chocolate, get under a blanket on this fall evening, sit in your comfy chair, and join me for Bible study and prayer. Uh, may it be a comforting place for you and your family. Keep me on your phone, link me to your television, and uh, let's hit God's Word, can we? Welcome. It's Wednesday night. October the 14th, and time for a Bible study and prayer meeting. We are continuing. This is our second week in the book of Colossians. I'm really excited about it. Really excited about tonight's passage because it's a beautiful piece of art. There are a few passages in Paul's letters where he just really becomes a poet, uh, becomes a master class in writing and theology, and becomes a wordsmith. And this is one of those nights. And so one of these passages. So we are in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. So open it up. See for yourself this incredible passage about the preeminence of Christ. Preeminence is a big word, but it just means he's first and foremost. So uh, we'll start out with a story, and maybe you've heard of a church like this or a denomination like this. But there is a denomination or a church or a congregation using market research, focus groups, um, and they have designed their weekly service that deliberately de-emphasizes Christ. One of the founders of the congregation said, the sad fact is, in the, the name of Jesus Christ has become, for many people, exclusionary. Using Hindu and Zen intermingled with a few verses from the Bible and recorded music by Willie Nelson, the leader of this group is quoted as saying, We're enabling people to discover God themselves, maybe through Jesus, maybe through Buddha, maybe through any number of ways. Now, I hope when you hear that, you are appalled by this defamation of Christianity. And we should be. But before we come down too hard on them, I want to address this very dangerous and deadly disease running rampant in our evangelical churches today. And at first it might seem harmless, but it is not in ha harmless. As a matter of fact, it's harming many churches, many pulpits today. And it's not the coronavirus. And sometimes maybe even I have been guilty of putting too much emphasis on this. Instead of calling people to faith, repentance, and, and submission to the supremacy of Christ and who he is, surrendering all to him, we tell people that their relationship with Jesus will give them a happy marriage or a stress-free life. He's a self-help that helps all the other areas of our life. And that's why we should embrace Jesus. That's why we should worship him. While Jesus does have the ability to improve our marriages, does have the ability to help us in our stress levels. When we bow before his preeminence, we must move away from this idea of how can Jesus help me? What can Jesus do for me? Is Jesus nothing but a spiritual ATM for us? Or are we living under his lordship? Do we simply add Jesus to our lives? Or is he, is he <laughs> our lives? And we follow him in obedience. So that's what brings us to our passage today in the book of Colossians. Much of the false teaching taking place in Colossae had to do with minimizing Jesus. Many people thought that he was important, but not essential. They'd given them a place in their lives without recognizing that he demands first place. Jesus was preeminent to Paul. He was preeminent. That's what he wanted the church of Colossae to hold him as preeminent. At Colossae, scholars were dismissing Jesus as just one God of many, one good man. And Paul says, nope, <laughs> it is Jesus. Jesus above all. He is God. So Paul writes a hymn to Christ, probably using an Old Testament praise song, uh, maybe even to the music of one of the psalms that we have in the book of Psalms, but he gives it new words. 
Uh, we sang a song on Sunday uh, that had different words, but it was uh, more popular for a different song. And you knew the you knew the uh, the tune, but it was new words. Well, Paul here is probably taking an old tune and he rewrites the words to write this master class of a description of the preeminence of Christ. No passage in the Bible is so jam-packed with doctrine as this one. And as a matter of fact, Paul is so excited about it. Verse 15 through 23 is one long run-on sentence in the Greek. And he has a tendency to do this whenever he's excited about what he's talking about. And he gets excited about talking about Jesus. And so he writes this one long run-on sentence, but it is a beautiful master class of a description of Christ. So let's take a look at it together. I want to start with verses 15 through 17. So you read along with me. Verse 15. He, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Here we see that Jesus is the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of creation. And this passage uh, has some semblances or similarities to Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 through 13. 31. I want to read it. Um, that sounds like a lot of passages, but in Proverbs, it's not that long. But here in Proverbs, um, the author is describing uh, the God, the Lord of creation, and he uses he. And so, uh, remarkably, he's speaking about Jesus in the book of Proverbs. He's not saying him by name, but he's describing the same person. Listen to this. This is Proverbs 8, verses 22 through 31. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginnings of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains he had shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, before he made the earth with its fields of the first of the dust of the world, where he established the heavens I was there, when he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned it to the seas its limit, so when the waters might not trespass his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of men. And so this uh, the passage used the word wisdom, but throughout Scripture, Jesus is likened and equated with wisdom, the Word of God. And so here, wisdom is saying, I was with God when it took place. I was there. I was delighting in creation, especially in the delighting in the children of men. So here is this returning to this theme, and the, Paul is at the beginning of this passage of Proverbs 8, 22 through 31. There's some uh, descriptions that he gives in those verses. The first is that he is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. We never have to ask, what is God like? Because we've seen his image in Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, read about Jesus. See how he behaves. See how he treats children. See how he divvies out grace and forgiveness and love. See how he interacts with the invalid. See how he interacts with the sick. See how he interacts with the sinner. If you want to know how God is and what he looks like and how he behaves and what his character is, read about Jesus. You do not have to wonder what our God is like. Second, he's firstborn of all creation. Now that is not that he has been born. Uh, many, actually even the Jehovah Witnesses, will use this passage to say that what Jesus was born, he was created by God. And that is not the case. The, using this phrase, he's saying that he has all the rights of the firstborn child. Uh, the firstborn child uh, had all had the priority of inheritance. The uh, firstborn child had um, the 
as was first in line for the heir, and so uh, there's greater importance placed on the firstborn. And so um, the scripture here is saying that Jesus is the firstborn, the one of most importance to all of creation. The third thing the passage says is that by him all things were created. He created everything by Jesus. It's Jesus who created all things. The next thing it says is that he's the creator of all dominions and authorities. He's the creator of all dominions and authorities. That's all earthly dominions, all angels, all supernatural realms. Jesus is the creator of all of them. Next, it says he was before all things. One of the things we know that he was not born at creation, as that passage says at first, because it's followed by this phrase, and the scripture can't contradict itself, so you have to work it out how it does work together. Um, and so he was born before all things, it says. Uh, and so he has always been. And then lastly, all things hold together because of him. All things hold together because of him. A guide took a group of people through an autonomy, uh, an autonomy laboratory and explained how all matter was composed of rapidly moving electronic particles. Uh, and the, so the tourists uh, studied the models of molecules and were amazed to learn that matter was made up primarily of space. So when you get down to it on the molecular level, you know that a molecule is mostly space. It's not matter, it's space. Uh, and that's an incredible thing about science. Um, and so uh, the scientist was explaining this, and so during the questioning, one visitor asked, uh, if that's the way that matter works, what holds it all together? And the guide of the science laboratory had no answer. What holds all these molecules together? What holds the world together? But the Christian has the answer. It's Jesus Christ. This passage tells us all things hold together because of him. Which hearkens to Hebrews 1.3. Hebrews 1.3 says this, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the words of his power. After making purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Did you, get, did you get, catch that? He upholds the universe by his word. It's God. It's Jesus that holds the universe together. Even everyone out there who curses Jesus' name, says he doesn't exist, uh, says he has no power over their lives, is made up. Jesus is holding the very atoms of their body together by his grace. Uh, and may we never forget that. Uh, let's keep reading. As I said, incredible theology in this passage. Am, am I wrong? Am I wrong? All right, let's keep reading. Verses 18 through 20. Again, in your English, they've put in punctuation. They have separated these into sentences, but you need to know in the Greek, it is all one long run-on sentence. 18 through 20. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that is everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by blood of his cross. Uh, so that's verses 18 through 20. Here we see the description of Jesus being the Lord of redemption. The Lord of redemption. And this passage tells us several things about that. First, that Jesus is the head of the church. He's the head of the body. The church is always call, often called uh, the body. If you read 1 Corinthians 12, that whole passage, plus some, talks about the church being the body of Christ. How you might be an elbow, or somebody else might be the knee, or somebody might be the ear, or the eye, or the nose, or hair. I don't know what part you might be, but the point is, every single one of us is an important part of the body of Christ. And we are not part of the church when we are not active in the church, when we're not attending the church, it's like we're missing part of our body. And that is outside the will of God. God would not have us behave that way on our own. But you know who's in control of the church? You know who's, um, who's the head of the church? It's not me. It's not the pastor. It's not the deacons. Uh, it's not the people who have been around the longest. Uh, it's Jesus. Jesus is the head 
of the church. Not only the local church, that's the way it should be in the local church, and certainly the worldwide church as well. Next, that passage tells us that Jesus was the first to raise himself from the dead. Jesus raised other people from the dead, um, but nobody has ever raised themselves from the dead. There's only one person who has ever, ever defeated death, Jesus Christ. Third, it says, in him is the, was the fullness of God. That is telling us that Jesus is fully God. He's not subset of God. He's not smaller than God. He's not uh, a different part of God. He is fully God himself, along with the Father. Uh, next, it says that we find reconciliation for all things comes. All, reconciliation of all things to God, comes through Jesus. So that means every single person, every single person, the only way they're reconciled to God is through Jesus Christ. And not only that, but all things, all animals, the earth itself. What happened when um, Jesus died on the cross? There was a great earthquake. It turned black. It, there was a great earth shake. The temple tore wide open. Why? It says the graves opened up. Why did that happen? It was a recognition that the earth had been unreconciled to God for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, ever since the fall in Genesis. But when Jesus set things right, it even affects the earth itself. And then when Revelation comes, there'll be great earthquakes. The world will turn on itself, to say the least, when Jesus comes back to finally complete the reconciliation process by taking us to be with him and be his own. Jesus is not just preeminent over us as souls and Christians in the spiritual world. He is preeminent and uh, brings reconciliation not only to people, but to the earth itself. That's why he's going to bring a new earth. He's going he's to create a new earth. As I said, lots of theology in here. I wasn't pulling your chain. Next, he's the author of peace through the cross. He's author of peace through the cross. Uh, just like in the great book of Isaiah, that great Christmas passage, uh, Isaiah lists Jesus as the prince of peace. No Jesus, no peace. No peace, no Jesus. All right, last three verses. Verses 21 through 23. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds... He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Here we see that Jesus is the Lord of reconciliation. He's the Lord of reconciliation. We already saw that. Uh, up uh, just a few verses before about how everything is reconciled to God through Jesus. But now he comes back to this understanding that Jesus is the reconciler. Uh, he's the Lord of reconciliation. And he does that through the cross. And he provides us several things through the cross, according to this passage. The first thing is that we become holy. We become holy. Uh, holy is a word for being set apart. And so... Uh, when we enter into relationship with Christ, Christ sets us apart. We are different. We are heirs. Uh, we are above the world. We are uh, in a different relationship than everybody else. We are set apart, holy, like God, which is incredible. Second, that we are blameless. This is the same language that's used to describe the lamb sacrifices needed in the Old Testament sacrifices to be approved by God. And so Jesus, through his work on the cross, his work of reconciliation, makes our lives holy and blameless, acceptable to God. You would never bring a crippled lamb uh, to God for a sacrifice. You would never bring one that was blemished. You'd never bring one that was lame. You always brought your best to God, one that was blameless or uh, blemishless, uh, without sin, uh, to suffice for your sacrifice before God. Well, Jesus was that perfect sacrifice that we could never be. 
So when God looks at us, when we receive the blood of Jesus Christ, we become blameless. And then finally, through the cross, he reconciles us and makes us above reproach, meaning nobody can uh, accuse us. Nobody can accuse us. Um, I've been watching the uh, justice trials today, and uh, what a phenomenal uh, piece of character uh, that uh, that Supreme Justice nominee is, and how she has ca carried herself with grace and dignity after ut much reproach. Many people trying to attack her, and uh, yet she has shown herself above reproach. Um, what incredible character uh, and a grace under fire. Well, I would love to be able to be like that. But through Christ, when anybody tries to attack us, when anybody tries to put blame or shame on us for our sin, we, because of the cross, are beyond reproach. All right, then finally, the last verse tells us that we can experience this reconciliation if we do two things. One, continue in the faith. Continue in the faith. True Christians endure to the end. Um, there's always a big debate. Do you believe, Pastor Wayne, do you believe in once saved, always saved? Uh, well, I think that's a misnomer and an unbiblical phrasing. Uh, you have people that accept Christ, uh, and they seem to be very genuine, um, but somewhere along the line, they fall across the way, they fall away, they don't attend church anymore, they might even uh, reject Christ, reject the church, and they go to live for themselves. And you're like, what happened? Uh, they seem to be a Christian at the beginning, and then they fell away. Are they not once saved, always saved? Well, that is evidence that that original decision wasn't as sincere as we thought it was. Because and only God knows that true decision. Only God knows if that person is truly given lordship over to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if somebody is genuine in that relationship and truly turns their heart over to Jesus Christ, they will not fall away. They will endure to the end. They will continue in the faith, as this, this says. Like builders building a castle on the sand or on a rock, a person that is not built right is not truly a Christian and will not stand to the end. Somewhere along the line, their understanding, their theology was wrong. It might have been more social. It might have been more, I want God as an ATM, or I want God for fire, uh, for fire insurance. But it was never, I am surrendering totally, and everything that that means to my Lord and Savior. Because if it was, it'll last. So in that way, I don't believe in one saved, always saved. Uh, that because... Uh, if you're looking at that situation where somebody started out as a Christian, then they uh, rejected Christ and never came back. But I do accept once saved, always saved, is if your relationship is genuine, if you have a true understanding of what it means to turn your life totally over to Christ, uh, being walking in obedience, walking in relationship with him, walking uh, in truth, uh, that will be once saved, always saved. Uh, there will be not be any turning away because God, nobody can take us out of the hand of God. And I hope that makes sense. I hope I didn't muddy the water for you. And then lastly, uh, we can experience that reconciliation if we're not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Uh, we can't change the gospel. Uh, the gospel is what it is. And we have to stand everything on the gospel. We can't add to it. We can't... Uh, add works to it. We can't add an institution to it. We can't add uh, rituals to it uh, in order to be saved. Uh, we can't add good works or mission trips or counting things off a checklist. The gospel is by faith and by faith alone. We can't add to it. Paul says, do not shift from the hope of the gospel. Wow, what an incredible passage. Uh, the supremacy, the preeminence of Christ. So I don't normally do this. If we were meeting in person, 
I would now at this time have you reflect on that passage, and I would play a song that goes along with what we're talking about. And uh, so tonight, I'm going to add a song at the end, and I want you to spend time in reflection. When we get done with our prayer time, I want you to read over this passage again, and then I want you to listen to the song. It's a song you probably know, you've probably sang it, but I want you to focus on the words, Above All, by Michael W. Smith. And it talks about how uh, Jesus is above all kings, he's above all kingdoms, he's above all natures, he's above all realms, he's above all, he's above all universes, he's above the stars, he's above all creation, he is above it all, just everything this passage has talked about. But then it ends, the chorus, by saying, in the midst of all that, the fact that he is above all those things, he thought of me, he thought of you, above all, and he gave his life for us. What an incredible Savior we serve. What a great passage. You pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this great, great passage. I thank you that Jesus is Lord of all, that he is the image of the unseen God, that he is firstborn of all creation, that by him all things were created, that he's the creator of all dominions and authorities, that he's before all things, that he holds all things together. Lord, we thank you that he's the head of the body, that he's first to raise himself, that he's the fullness of God, that he's the reconciliation for us in all things, that he's the author of peace, that he longs through the cross to present us as holy and blameless and above reproach, and that he thought of us, even in the midst of all that, to give his life for us. We thank you for Jesus Christ and who he is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, um, the uh, we're going to turn now to our prayer request list. Want to check in with everybody. Let's check in who we have here before we go to our prayer list. I know we've got lots of people watching tonight. Lots of people checking in. Patsy Davis and Bob Cross, Barbara Garrison, Elaine, thanks for watching. Patsy Davis, Robert Fiend, Greg Rushing. Nancy Harrison, thanks for watching. Trish Shackelford, Ron Montgomery, and Nancy Hightower Harrison. Thank you for checking in and uh, being with us tonight. Hope you're comfortable in your easy chair, got your scripture on your lap, and uh, spending time in God's Word with us. All right, so let's change uh, uh, modes and move into prayer mode, if you will. We need to pray uh, for our church, so we're going to start there. Uh, we want to meet, pray that we meet the needs of our community. We had over 150, almost 200 pounds of food donated to the Fort Mill Care Center this week. Thank you if you gave food. And that's all we just had record of. There are people that gave and then told us the poundage uh, later on Sunday. But we may not have gotten everybody. But we know at least we have close to 200 pounds that was donated to Fort Mill Care Center. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for meeting the needs of our community. But we need to continue to do that. We need to pray for our children's ministry. Uh, as we come out of COVID, we need to have a plan for what we're going to do to reach young families and children with our church. And so you pray about that. Please pray about that for us. We need to pray for the lost amongst us. Who's your one? Who are you praying for? In just a few minutes, we're going to pray. And I want you to pray for your one, the one that you are praying that will accept Christ, the one that you're praying for an opportunity to have a spiritual conversation with. Uh, the one that you're praying to invite to church. So uh, then we need to pray for our budget needs. Of course, our, uh, we're, um, we've had to lower our budget due to the lower income that we've had due to COVID. And so just pray that God will meet our needs as a church. Will you spend some time in prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to lift up Flint Hill Baptist Church. We want to be a beacon to this community. We want to be a church that changes lives. We want to be a church that's filled with world changers, that's changing the world around us. So, Lord, we pray for that for Flint Hill Baptist Church. We want to be a vibrant church that is a beacon, a lighthouse to this community. We want it to be filled with people whose lives are being changed. We want uh, the gospel to be proclaimed. We want people's lives to be transformed. We pray that for our church. Pray that with all that I am. Lord, I pray our people will pray for that for all, with all that they are. 
Lord, we pray that we will meet the needs of our community because when we meet needs, it opens up doors to the gospel. Lord, we pray for our children's ministry. Uh, I'm grieved that we are not reaching children as we should. And Lord, I pray that uh, we as a church will be able to turn that around and start meeting the needs of children in our community and minister to young families. Lord, we pray for our one. Spend some time praying for your one. Finally, Lord, we pray for uh, the meeting of our financial needs as a church. We just pray that you will be the great provider. And no matter what you provide, we pray that we will be good stewards of what you provide. Uh, the budget is a man-set thing. We try to seek your will uh, for our lives, but it's just a guide. Our true guide is to be um, to use wisely the resources that you've given us. So, Lord, we pray for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, some personal things that you can pray for. Uh, we want to pray for the election coming up. Uh, certainly, uh, we need God's involvement in our uh, election process and pray that God's people, I think it's not an un, it's a very godly thing, a very biblical thing to pray that his people will be involved in the process. That our people, his people, Christians, will not sit by the wayside and let other people decide the fate of our country. We as God's people are called to step up and vote our values and be involved in the process. And I pray that if you're one of those people, I never vote, I don't want to get involved in the process, that you'll repent of that and be involved this year. We need to pray for racial injustice that um, we see on the television and our society around us and pray that that will be eliminated. Uh, till Christ reigns supreme or preeminent in all our lives, it probably will not. But we can pray that people's hearts will be changed. I'm going to pray for James and Glenda Bell. Marie Chandler's daughter and son-in-law talked to her today, and they are in recovery, but she had a whole part of her family be hit with COVID, and she was very concerned for them, uh, but they are getting better, so we give thanks for that. I'm going to pray for Wendy Clark's family members, kidney failure and heart issues. Pray for my mom. Uh, next week, one week from today, she'll be having her port placed. So thank you for your prayers for her, uh, and uh, she'll be starting the chemotherapy on the 26th. I'm going to pray for the family of Ronnie Eads. Ronnie Eads was one of my friends, and he had COVID. He's been struggling in the hospital in the ICU for a month. His son is a very good friend of mine, pastor friend, and they're just devastated. Absolutely devastated, as are we. Uh, just a sweet, sweet man, generous in heart. Uh, whenever we went to visit, uh, opened up their home like it, it was our own, and uh, just pray for their family. The funeral will be this Saturday, um, and so just pray for that. I'm going to pray for Carol Ford, uh, who's undergoing chemotherapy uh, for breast cancer, and um, she's in, I think, this week having her third treatment. I'm going to pray for Heather Newman, David Miner's daughter, who's recovering from a car accident. Pray for Jim Rudisil. Uh, he is still in Presbyterian downtown and not doing well, uh, so please pray for him. We will pray for Walter Strait, who is our uh, custodian dealing with foot injury and diabetes, and that combination is not good. So pray for Walter. Uh, if you have any other prayer requests, put them up there, and we can add them to the list, or we can just pray tonight. Don't have to add them. You can say don't add or do add, um, and I, we can pray for them tonight on Facebook Live with you. Or you can say, Wayne, just pray for me privately for this, and uh, I can do that for you. Uh, we'll lift up those and need a continual prayer. Just kind of looking over the list here. John Butler continues not to do well. He's in Westminster Rehab. Uh, else? Sandra Culp is doing better each day. Get to see her uh, each Sunday, and that's been a great blessing. Uh, Barbara Gibbs has not had any uh, seizures, uh, harsh seizures in a while. I haven't talked to him this week, but as of last week, she was doing pretty well. Pray for Steve Hartley, who's diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so uh, just trying to get his head wrapped around that diagnosis and how to move forward. So pray for him. Uh, we want to pray for Chuck Lehman, uh, who is by himself. And that's very difficult after the loss of his wife and new uh, living facility. Pray for him. And uh, tweets, talk to them. They were doing well. 
And so then we remember our homebound and those in assisted living facilities. Uh, I've already mentioned John Butler, Sue Carswell, Carl Eaton, Bob Hall, Kathy Miner, Jack Newell, Joanne Payne, Dora Smith, and Betty Wallace. I encouraged you on Sunday, I would like your family to write. I do this every Wednesday night. And those of you that are faithful, thank you for doing that. But I encouraged our whole church, even those that don't watch on Wednesday night on Sunday, for every person in your family to write at least one card to one of these people on this list. And it is my desire that at the end of this week that our the people on this list will be overwhelmed with cards. And if you need an address, please just contact Miss uh, Natalie. If you don't get one of these in the mail, you can contact our church office and she'll get you on the email list. But let's uh, pray for these names. Will you spend some time in prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray for our election. We pray for the racial injustice that we see around us. May we do what we can to combat it anytime we can in our circles or our circles of influence. We pray for James and Glenda Bell. We pray for them. Thank you that they're doing well. We pray for Wendy Clark's family members. Pray for Miss Leela Deffinger. Pray for the family of Ronnie Eads. Pray for Carol Ford for Heather Newman, for Jim Rudisill, for Walter Strait. Pray for those that are dealing with ongoing conditions and pray that you will uh, make yourself known in each of their situations. We pray for those that are homebound and in living facilities. We pray that you will uh, be with their caretakers as they many times are isolated as well and seem stuck and... Um, uh, they want to care for their loved ones, but sometimes feel helpless and insufficient in that role. So, Lord, I pray for guidance for them. I pray for your presence for them. Let them know uh, that they are doing angels' work, to say the least. Lord, we pray for those serving our country and our civil servants amongst us, and pray that you protect them and their families and give them blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, just a few announcements, I think. Um, actually, I'll let, oh, here it is right here. We are in the middle of our virtual business meeting. If you have not replied and or your spouse, please call Miss Patsy Davis or email her back and give in your vote. We want as much participation as possible. Um, if you are a member of a church, it is your responsibility. You are part, remember the parts of the body we were talking about? God has called you to be involved in the life of the church and helping us make decisions. The Holy Spirit living in you helps inform us as the body of believers together. And so don't shirk that responsibility. Be part of that responsibility. Uh, and so do that for us. Know that... Um, uh, what else we got going on? I need you to say a special prayer for me. This weekend, I'm leading uh, a, a men's retreat, or not, a men's conference. I'm uh, one of the featured speakers, and I'll be teaching about what it means uh, to be a spiritual leader in your home and how to do that on a weekly basis. And so you can pray for me for that. That's this Saturday. Uh, i trying to think what other announcements we might have. Oh, yes. Um, don't forget your bread baskets. Fill it up. Put that on the middle of your... Uh, uh, table and put um, money in there uh, every time you eat and bring it on the last Sunday of this month for our hunger relief offering. And that'll be done, I think that's the 25th on that Sunday. And then we will have worship outside on Sunday. Could be a little cool. Every time I said it's been a little cool, it warmed up just fine. So I'm hoping that's be the case this time. But you might just have your jacket in your car or your coat in your car just in case or a pair of mittens because um, it could be cool. Uh, but it'll probably warm up just like it always has. God has blessed us so much. So that'll be at 9.30 on Sunday morning. All Sunday school classes will meet. I think besides uh, the TEL classroom, uh, we'll be meeting outside. Our foundations class will uh, start meeting this week. So we'll almost have a full slate of Sunday school classes outside on the lawn under the trees um, this Sunday. I know Bob Veen's class will be meeting outside. They will not be having Zoom meeting this Thursday because they'll be meeting on church on Sunday. Of course, we'll be broadcasting the service. If you don't feel comfortable coming out, it'll be on Facebook Live as well, or you can't be with us in person. So those are our announcements. I hope you have a great evening. I hope you uh, uh, will join me next week. I've fallen in love with the book of Colossians as I've been taking a deeper look at it. So have a great week, 
If you need anything at all, reach out to us. Know that I love you.